Edward Said was born in Jerusalem and educated in Egypt and then the United States, where he's been teaching English and comparative literature ever since. His most influential book, Orientalism, argues that the East is a European invention, an artificial device that's enabled Europeans to worship an idealized Orient at the same time as plundering, slaughtering, and displacing its peoples. It's a predicament that Said has lived out in his own experience. He's a Palestinian, and at considerable personal risk, he's spoken out for the Palestinian cause, even while his intellectual work has continued to explore the limitations of the very idea of national identity. You wrote somewhere that Palestinian experience is so fragmented that classical concepts don't apply to it. What about the concept of rights? Well, we are in the unique position of being a people whose enemies say that we don't exist. So for us, uh, the concept of rights means the right to exist as a people, as a collective uh, whole body, rather than as a collection of uh, refugees, stateless people, uh, citizens of other countries. So it has, the, in, in a certain sense, it has the most urgent meaning for us, uh, since from the beginning of our struggle against the Zionist movement and against then later Israel, uh, our principal goal is to get to step one. Uh, we are still a long way from uh, you know, national rights. And you know, in the current climate of peace talks and all the, the so-called peace process that the Americans speak about, there is no phrase uh, signaled by the Americans or the Israelis that suggests that we have self-determination or national rights. So we're, we're very much at the starting post. You talk about national rights and self-determination, but is a nation really a self that ought to have rights to determination? It's a tricky question, but I think in the case of the Palestinians, uh, yes, uh, because we have a long history of uh, inhabitants on the land of Palestine. We were a coherent society with a collective memory, uh, a, a language, Arabic of course, which is like the language of other Arab uh, people in Arab countries. Ours is a distinctive brand of Arabic. We had sent uh, members to represent us to the Ottoman parliament in the 1870s. Uh, and part of the uh, battle, uh, the intellectual and cultural battle that we've uh, had to fight since the beginning of this or the 20th century has been to show that we are a people. And as a people, uh, there are two things open to us. One is subservience and finally suppression and extinction. And the other alternative is to exist in a national state with the rights that are now the rights allowed by most peoples in the world today. And we've opted for the second. But isn't the very idea of a national state, a state nation or a nation state, one that contains all sorts of traps? I mean, one view would say that the idea of a nation is a kind of contract whereby the ruling elites of different jurisdictions make it sound as though any injury to the elite is actually an injury to every person who lives under their jurisdiction. And the idea of national identity and a right to national identity serves to make that, uh, make that illusion. So that in international law, you get the idea that invading a nation state is a matter of violating every individual within it. And isn't that an illusion? Or do you think that's too cynical a view of the way that... Well, I think it's, 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 it's partly cynical, it's partly incomplete. In, in our case, uh, it has to be remembered that there are sort of two levels to Palestinian nationalism. On the one hand, it is an urgent necessity for people, the large majority of whom, I would say, today, enjoy no rights at all, precisely because of their national origins. Let's say they're Palestinian. For example, there are 400 plus thousand Palestinians in Lebanon. All of them exist as stateless people. And they have pieces of paper say, you are stateless. So in, in a certain sense, this is invidious nationalism. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, uh, that level can be addressed, as you said, by uh, founding national identity, having a state, all of the traditional, one might say conventional, attributes of that, about which one has mixed feelings, obviously, because it can lead to all sorts of abuses and so on. But the other level for the Palestinians is, which is the more important one as far as I'm concerned, is that the Palestinian struggle in the Middle East in particular, in the Arab world and with regard to Israel, is a vanguard struggle 
in that it is a secular struggle in a part of the world where religious nationalism is very, very, very powerful. I mean, the nationalism of Islam in places like Iran, Algeria now, Jordan, Jewish nationalism as the right wing in Israel, which has dominated Israeli life for the last uh, 20 years, is an, is an example of that. And Christian fundamentalist nationalism, as in Lebanon. So we are different. We're not a religious movement. We're a national movement for democratic rights. And the second attribute is that the Palestinian struggle is a vanguard struggle because it is a struggle for democracy in a part of the world where there is no democracy. And we make it very clear in our national uh, Declaration of Independence in 1988 that we are a secular struggle with rights, democratic rights, for all people, men and women, religions and creeds and sects. So in that respect, we are, we're much more than a small, petty nationalism, you see. And in that respect, it's a, it's, a, it's a brilliant and important struggle. Jews, of course, are likely to feel threatened by the sort of thing you're saying. You wrote somewhere that Zionism is a touchstone of political judgment in our time. Could you explain that? Yes, I mean, uh, Jews, uh, insofar as they are Zionists, that is, uh, people who believe in a return to Palestine, that is to say, the ancestral homeland of the Jewish people, um, are people who believe that they are entitled, for the most part, to sell rights in Palestine. What that overlooks, of course, is that there was another people there, and there is another people there now, most of them under occupation on the West Bank and Gaza since 1967, and about 800,000 who were the remnant of the Palestinians who were driven out in 1948 as second or third class citizens in a state which is described as the state of the Jewish people, not the state of the citizens, very important distinction. Um, now from my point of view, Zionism achieved very important things from the standpoint of Jews. But from the standpoint of its victims, I mean Zionism always had victims, it's a catastrophe because uh, the state of Israel was constructed um, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a conflict, if you like, of tragedies. On the one hand, here with the remnant of the Jewish people uh, who were massacred in Europe by Western anti-Semites coming to Palestine. They had come before the World War, but they, the, the state of Israel becomes the state of the survivors. And the construction of the state was on the ruins of our society. And, and, and it's, it's not a metaphor, because I remember, I was a boy, I grew up in Palestine. I remember what it was like to leave and one's whole family left. So from that point of, 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 of view, it's a conflict between a, a group of people who came as the victims, who in turn produced another victim, namely us. So we are the victims of the victims. And it's the most difficult choice, but I think it's a required choice on, on the basis of rights. But you can't deal with the rights of one people at the expense of the rights of another. Your work as a critic links up in quite deep and subtle ways, I think, with your concerns as a spokesperson for the Palestinian cause. And I'm thinking particularly of the fact that a theme in a lot of your criticism is space and geography. I think one could say that for a lot of previous criticism, the main theme had been time and history, but you, you changed that, or perhaps you and Raymond Williams would be mainly responsible for that. Well, I, I, you know, this isn't to say that if you're interested in geography, space, territory, you're not also interested in history. I, I'm really interested in the interaction between the two. But I do, it's to give primacy to geography, because it seems to me that the history of the last 300 years um, is, in fact, world history. And it's a globalized history. And what makes it intelligible, or one of the main things that makes it intelligible, is the struggle over territory. I mean, by, 80, by 1918, 85% of the world was under the domination of a handful of states in Europe and America. Uh, and since that time, I mean, I think one can understand the cultural and historical experience of, the, say, the period after World War II as the struggle to get back territory that had been taken uh, from people of color in the colonized world. So it, that's why it's terribly important to me. I mean, I, I see my own history and the history of my uh, people as a function of that struggle, the struggle over territory. And it was always territory, the interesting thing. It, wasn't, it was never territory taken for the sake of territory. It was never, you know, you didn't just simply go there and just say, well, I like this, I'm going to take it. There was always, I'm interested in the antecedent justification, you know. I mean, Australia is perfect for England because it's so far away, it's the antipodes. We could put all of our wanted, unwanted populations, the felons, down there. America is the promised land. So they go there and they colonize it because it's a new, a new Eden. 
uh, Palestine was the country of the reclaimed uh, uh, promised land for the Jews. But what always happens is a conflict of these justifications with the, you might say, the bodies, the realities of the people there. And it's, it, therefore, it's a struggle over geography, but also over justification and philosophy and epistemology. Now, whose land is it? Is it the right of the people who live there? I mean, for example, in the case of Palestine, one of the main arguments in early Zionist writing, and not only early, early Zionist, but early European writing about Palestine in the 20th century, was that it was uninhabited, or if it was inhabited, it was a land full of neglect, which was a similar argument used by French settlers in North Africa when they took Algeria. You know, it was a, an empty land. And they, in other words, the right to use the land and the right to imagine the best use for the land is given to the European, to the white man. So th that seems to me to be the foundation not only of actual political struggles, but also the construction of cultures. Uh, you know, because it's impossible to understand European culture without some sense, for example, in England, of the role played by India uh, or Australia or the Caribbean in English domestic life. All of that strikes me as a fantastically interesting field uh, and bears obviously a connection, bears a relationship to William's country in the city, for example, and the overseas territories and so on. You talked about epistemology and mm. certainly in your work on the geography of imperialism, mm. The leading theme, I think, is the idea that the East was constructed as a mystery which it took the West to know about. Mm. And there's a curious way in which your work on that subject has been caught up in the logic which it itself detonated. I mean that people have criticized you for writing so exclusively about the European view of the East um, and for neglecting agents who actually were in the East. What right. do you think of the way that's developed? Well, I, I think they're, they're to a certain extent right. I mean, that is to say, when I was writing Orientalism, I was really talking about European conceptions of the Orient, which are so, in some instances, so far beyond any local conception of what that geography might be, that it constructed a field and a subject all of its own. So it's perfectly, it seems to me now, even retrospectively, to say that it, it's OK to talk about it, because it constituted itself as an object uh, that had very little to do with what people there thought. Now, what I've done since then, however, is to look at the struggle over competing conceptions of geography. And um, uh, in my latest book, which is, will appear in a few months, uh, I really spend um, half the time looking at how, because of this, n nationalist struggles in Africa, in places like Ireland, in the Caribbean, in India, really had to begin the, the you might say, the reconquest of that territory and to do it initially epistemologically. In other words, to reimagine it the way, for example, Yeats reimagines the history of Ireland in terms of its uh, fairies and heroes and you know, great fighters and so on and so forth. And, and in fact produces, as somebody like Neruda does in, 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 uh, in Latin America, produces a new geography, which is a, the reclamation of the land, uh, so that you find really competing conceptions there. Uh, and I think you know, I've, I've been trying to do that, uh, but... Um, but what is very, very striking is the extent to which the prevailing conceptions uh, in, the, in, in Europe, in the West, are very difficult to dislodge because so much is invested in them. You know, I mean, it's not just a matter of somebody saying, I have an idea and I, I think this is the way it is. I mean, scientific institutions are built around. I mean, the Royal Geographic Society in England, uh, Rodney Murchison, for example, was a man who, as a geologist, as a geographer, as a surveyor, didn't only think he was exploring Africa, he actually said it was like a military campaign. Uh, and what he was trying to discover about the geography and the geology of Africa was, in a certain sense, adding to the realm of England. Uh, and along with that, therefore, went an enormous institution, the Ge Royal Geographical Society. Those are the things that one has to take seriously and not say, well, you know, they're just Western fictions. What about the, the situation of people in the English language, but not in Britain or America, thinking of people, say, readers in Africa reading Conrad, in the Caribbean reading The Tempest, mm. in India reading, reading Kipling, Kipling and Forster, right. What's that experience of reading? Well, it's a very different one. Uh, I mean, let's say you wanted to read as a Caribbean native uh, a novel by Jane Austen, who is, uh, perhaps of all English novelists, the most tied to a particular locale, which is very, very English, and extremely insular in that respect. Well, if you 
read with the eye of a Caribbean or the eye of an Indian a novel like Mansfield Park or Persuasion or Pride and Prejudice, you'll find very careful notations there of overseas territories that are held very much as in Mansfield Park, for instance. The estate of Sir Thomas Bertram is held by, by Bertram in Antigua. And the importance of Antigua, therefore, to the economy of Mansfield Park is absolutely central. But at the same time, you have a kind of illusion of it. It, it ceases to be important once it's mentioned that he had to go there and take care. And it was a slave sugar plantation. So if you read with those eyes, you can then see that the history of the English novel, great form that it is, is constructed with precisely those territories held in the imagination as much as they are held in England. Uh, and a totally different experience is emerges from the novel, from the reading of the novel. And a passage to India, for example, by Forster, or even more so, uh, a pass, um, Conrad's Heart of Darkness, becomes not just the explorations of, of Marlowe and, and Kurtz of that bit of, uh, of East Africa, but it really becomes a symbol for Africa and the enslavement and partition and the scramble for Africa. And that entails, of course, a much different reading than simply reading it as you would in a, in a, in a test or you know, for an English course. You read it as uh, Ngugi and uh, people like Chinua Achebe have read it, as you have to read it in a decolonizing way. You have to sort of strip from it all the assumptions that are there. And very often you have people like Achebe and Ngugi reading it, in some cases rejecting it, and rewriting its history in terms of your own apprehension of the, the river and the territory and so on and so forth. So it's a much more in my opinion, lively and invested process to read and interpret literature of that sort from the point of view of the, of the, of the colonies and, and, above all, the decolonizing colonies. Yeah, you've mentioned an Ngugi and Achebe, so that raises the question of being a writer of English right. outside, of the, outside of Britain and America, um, the situation of, I don't know, Yeats or Walcott or someone. Yeah. Um, Heaney has a phrase somewhere about how those people are in a situation of being caught on the forked stick mm. of their love for the English language. Right. It, well, it's not unique to English, by the way. I mean, it's, it's the case of French writers. Uh, I mean, there's a whole group of very interesting and important Algerian novelists, uh, like Katib Yassine, who writes in French, but was very much part of the Algerian resistance to, to French colonization. Uh, and, um, you know, there are Moroccan writers in the same way, who write, like Al-Abd Kabir Khatibi, who writes in French. Uh, I, th I think it's a very interesting case of really, uh, uh, which in a certain sense Ngugi uh, sort of finessed by then proceeding to write in the native language. I mean, he rejected English after, after having written several very distinguished novels and said, I want to write in my native language. But the challenge is there, that is to say, the language is a, is a field which one can work in, and it depends often on the premises. It's not the language itself which is infected. I mean, for example, Achebe says, that Conrad shouldn't be read at all. I mean, he's such a racist that The Heart of Darkness is an unreadable text uh, for Africans. And then he goes off and does his own novel in English. But I think the struggle within the language for values, for perceptions, for geographies exactly, is a continuing one. Uh, and it, in, in a certain sense has to be understood also in domestic terms. I mean, it's not everybody in England who writes from neo-colonial or, or imperial premises using English. Uh, one, when it, it, one can always find alternatives to it. And I think that's the great task of criticism today, is to read not with an eye to reestablish the orthodoxies and the perceptions and the dogmas, et cetera, that, that anchor the work, but rather to read to understand those, but also to try to understand them as dislodged to allow for other places. You know, as, as Aimé Césaire says, there's room for everyone at the rendezvous of victory. Uh, and that was a great example of somebody like C.L.R. James, that you could write a history of the French Revolution from the point of view of the Great Slave Revolt in Haiti. Uh, and that seems to me to be the interesting alternative, not what, what language you write in as such. Yeats is a particularly interesting example here, I think, because I think a lot of people would be surprised to see him regarded as a, as a poet of anti-imperialism rather oh, than as a poet of modernist internationalism. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think Yeats is uh, a particularly interesting case because he was very reactionary at the same time. And he was, you know, somebody who believed in great houses and 18th century nobility. And he was Anglo-Irish, after all, he belonged to the ascendancy. But in, in a certain sense, Yeats was a national poet. Uh, and he was one of the people who forged precisely this decolonizing imagination that gave rise to the, to the Irish Renaissance and continues today. So I think 
it's possible to, to see Yeats in two ways. On the one hand, as a man who slid off at the end of his life into a kind of terribly reactionary, even fascist politics, but whose poetry, uh, particularly up through the tower, and even after that in the 20s, was really the nationalist poetry that I think can be seen as, ha you, you, in other words, in the Irish context, he became a, a reactionary. Uh, but if you compare him with nationalist poets of his time, like Aimé Césaire later, or Neruda, or, or Tagore in India, you could see him as belonging to the decolonizing culture, which was an international culture. And that is to say that they, were, that they knew each other, knew about each other, and worked from similar premises in local situations that, that differed widely. And I think th to see Yeats simply as a modernist internationalist, as, he, as he's been taken, is I think to miss, uh, I would say, you know, a good part of the vigor and arrogance of his verse, you see, because for an Irish person to speak the way he did, to talk about it, Irish history in the way that he did, is an act of, of les majesté, which I think, uh, is, 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 whose force is undeniable. Your first book, I think it was, Joseph Conrad and the Fiction of Autobiography, was described by you as an attempt at a phenomenological kind of criticism, and you talked about Sartre and Merleau-Ponty as the inspiration of the book. Is that still the inspiration of your work, or has its direction changed? I would say probably yes, but I wouldn't perhaps use the word phenomenology. I mean, what interested me about those people, I mean, Sartre and Merleau-Ponty uh, and Husserl at the time, was that they seemed to uh, situate uh, the study of forms, for example, or it was possible through them to understand the study of forms as, as taking place in a context, in a, in a, in a whole environment. And when I, when I grew up as a student and, a, uh, and as a graduate, I, I was living in an era of high formalism where the work itself, I mean, the, you know, the Cleanth Brooks, the, the new criticism was really the sort of dominant Thing. And, I, and I found that somebody like Conrad, who at that time was really scarcely known, I mean, this is in the, in the late 50s and early 60s, uh, except as a writer of, uh, of, you know, sort of highly polished formalist kinds of things, that something was missing. And what was missing was what I answered to uh, in his work, namely this uh, tremendous dimension of exile and, uh, and dislocation and so on. And there was, an ex there was a vocabulary at hand in the works of the phenomenologists and existentialists. Um, and I, I I've, you know, you made use of it, shamelessly exploited it, to, to be able to look at Conrad in that way. And it was a study, really, of Conrad's life in his work, but not, not as, you know, sort of anecdotal events that he had been to Africa, he had been to Borneo and put that in a story and so on, but rather that, it, that he was always trying to reconstruct his experience in a, in a whole way, in, in forms that would yield to insight and, and investigation and analysis, usually unsuccessfully. I mean, Conrad's own uh, unsuccessful attempts to get to the bottom. So I found that very stimulating. And in a certain sense, I've gone on to try to do that. That is, that is to say, to try and see works in a, in a situation or a context. I mean, situation, situation, in the Saturday sense, remains very important to me. But all the you know, heavy, jargonistic, and sort of uh, metaphysical language that goes along with it is now, for me, sort of out it's irrelevant in a way. One of the themes in the Conrad book is Conrad's total expatriation, I think mm. you say, his separation, the way that he tried to relate himself only very artificially to the tradition of novel writing in English because he was a well-traveled Pole and right. all of that. Well, new and, it's, and it seemed to me that the, that theme is taken up, really, in your work of the 70s on beginnings, which if I understand it correctly, is a sort of definition of what modernism means, right. which is defined in terms of having beginnings rather than origins, right. of situating yourself in relation tradition to tradition by adjacency rather than by continuity. Do you still think that that idea of a break with tradition is adequate as a characterization of modernism? Well, it's a break with tradition up to a point. I mean, I think it is an accurate, uh, an accurate definition of it. It, it, it in, in that something cataclysmic happened, right? And in, in the case of modernism, it was probably the First World War, uh, changes in the sort of economic and political topography of Europe, a number of things. Later on uh, in my uh, current work, uh, 
I have a new theory of modernism that, that accommodates itself to precisely this, that one of the things that is directly involved in the creation of what we call European modernism, that would include people like Joyce and Eliot and Thomas Mann and Proust and all the rest of it, is in fact, is in fact the crisis in the imperial world. I mean, they're, 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 one has a sense at the horizon of their work that there's some disturbance at the peripheries, which is having an effect like the plague in Death in Venice, for example, which comes from the East, becomes the metaphor for the, for the change in Europe that it can no longer e exist in its own structure. And therefore, what the writer has to do is to reconstruct. You see, it's a break with tradition, but an attempt, sometimes a desperate attempt, as in the case of Eliot, to rebuild. And that's why the metaphor for me, the, the great metaphorical figure for me, was provided by Vico in the New Science, in that book on beginnings, where Vico is the great um, uh, sort of uh, uh, theorist of self-invention. Uh, and, the, and the figure he uses, you recall, is that there's a big flood. Uh, and uh, after the flood, men are left uh, lying around the great giants. And in order to, con to live as human beings, they make the choice to construct uh, societies. Uh, they construct marriage, religion, uh, civil institutions. And that becomes the metaphor. Uh, for the, the new world that he talks about in the new science. And I saw that as inspiring the, you know, the, 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 the onset of European modernism. But underlying that for me, you see, was the 67 war in the Middle East, which was a great crisis in my own uh, life. I had spent most of my time. Uh, my family was in the Middle East. I had gone to America as a student by myself. And I had more or less you know, lived uh, uh, as much as possible a, a life as a student and then later as a scholar in America without reference, really, uh, professionally or even emotionally to this world that I left behind, which was shattered in 1967. The rest of Palestine was destroyed and taken over by the Israelis. The Arab world, as I had knew it, known it, grown up in it, was completely changed. Um, and this then was the, you might say, the autobiographical impetus to, to rethink the whole question of what it means to start again, to begin. Uh, and it involved acts of choice and acts of designation rather than things that come from heaven. That's why the emphasis on the secular is so, is so great as far as I'm concerned. So it's a conjury of things, a number of things working at the same time. Your most recent book is about music and it's about the pleasure that you personally take in music. It's, well, it's a curious combination in a way because it contains a lot of discussion of a kind that people would have expected in a book by Said. That's to say, it talks about the development of the institutions of Western classical music, the definition of Western classical music versus the East, mm -hmm. and the rise of the cult of soloists and celebrities mm -hmm. and solitary listening and the influence of the technologies of reproduction and all of that. Mm -hmm. But in the midst of that, there is an emphasis on pleasure mm. of a kind that people wouldn't quite have expected. Is this, a, is this a new development in your work? I shouldn't like to think so. No, I think, I mean, it's been there all along. I, I, I must confess to feeling at times rather uh, beset by these contests that I find myself in because I'm a Palestinian or because I belong to one or another school of literary or philosophical or, or political criticism. And it seemed to me that what had, what had been happening, uh, in, in, at least in the United States, was that one w becomes almost entirely a creature of those things which are completely professional or professionalized, which is worse, you see. So that you lose any, any contact with whatever it is that you're doing. I mean, it becomes just a matter of earning your, you know, your honorarium or your salary. And um, I, I like to think of myself, and I think gen in many ways I am more moved by what I like and what I want to do rather than about what I don't like or what I'm forced to do. So it seemed to me that one thing to do would be to write about music um, and to focus on those aspects of music that are completely intimate uh, and provide a, a very sustaining kind of pleasure, which has been there really all, all through my life, I mean, from my earliest consciousness. Given that you were born in Jerusalem, how did you become inducted into European literature? Well, I grew up really biculturally. I always went to uh, English schools, uh, both Palestine and Egypt, where my family subsequently lived, were British colonies. And uh, I guess I belonged to the uh, elite of our country. And we were sent to British schools. And um, so I grew up really studying uh, 
English in, in school and speaking Arabic at home uh, and with my friends. So I, I it really, I have no memory of not looking at European books. Uh, it's really been a very, very steady all my life. But I always felt that I wasn't European at the same time. I mean, it was sort of, perhaps it was the, the schools I went to that made me feel that, because they were always English teachers and mostly Arab boys. I went to boys' schools. One felt sort of excluded, and that, and that being educated in the language and the literature was a process of trying unsuccessfully to acculturate to it. Uh, one, one was always found wanting. Would it be facile to say that it was an easy assimilation to make because so much modern, modernist European literature is about exile and displacement, mm. and so you were exiled and displaced, so it was your literature? I wasn't always exiled and displaced. I mean, I always felt slightly divided because I was, I mean, I, I come from a Christian uh, minority, and within that minority in Palestine, we, we were about 10% uh, of the Arab population of Palestine, which was mostly Muslim. And then within that uh, Christian minority, we were a, a Protestant minority, even smaller. So there was always a sense of being slightly uh, skewed, you know, off to this from the center. And then the fact that uh, I went to these schools and got to be good at speaking English and writing English and French and so on, uh, you know, was 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 added to the peculiarity of the whole thing. So in a certain sense, I felt uh, peculiar, and this literature seemed to resonate with what, I, with what I felt, although not all of it seems that way, but certainly modern, modern literature does, yes, and, and that's what, what I was most interested in. I, I never really felt completely at home in earlier periods of literature, you know, when I was getting my, my, my professional degrees, you know, as a scholar of literature. I loved the 18th century, but it, it seemed like almost studying a foreign culture, whereas the 20th century, uh, particularly with these expatriate figures and wanderers like Joyce and so on, um, was much closer to me. People with a taste for periodization, or even a mania for periodization, tell us that modernism is over and we're now in the epoch of postmodernism. What do you think of that? I suppose it's true uh, to people who think exclusively in terms of America and advertising culture and the media and pastiche and that sort of thing. But if you're, if you're aware of other worlds than, say, Madison Avenue and um, high-tech architecture, you'll realize that the battle for the modern, and mo therefore modern as in modernity, is, for example, in parts of the world that I'm uh, familiar with and affiliated with, like the Middle East, a very, very important one. It is indeed the battle, because, don't forget, we live in an age where the whole question of what the tradition is and what the prophet said and what the holy book said and what God said and what Jesus said, etc., are issues that people go to war over. And as in the case of Salman Rushdie, who was uh, sort of a t uh, condemned to death for what he wrote, that is for us the battle, the battle over what the modern is and the interpretation of the past is. Uh, it's very, very, very important in our part, of, in, in, the, in, the, in the Arab and Islamic world. There is a school of writers, of poets, of essayists, of intellectuals who are fighting a battle for the right to be modern, you see, because our, our, our history is governed by turath or heritage. But the question is, who designates what the heritage is? That's the problem. So for us, the crisis of modernism and modernity is the crisis over authority and the right of the individual and the writer and the thinker to express himself or herself. It's also the battle for women's rights. So, you know, the whole question of postmodernism to us is, a, is an interesting sort of, you know, sort of it's a Candidian kind of question in the West. But for us, modernism as in modernity is, is, the, is the issue of moment. I've noticed that in a, several contexts recently, you've described yourself as being on the conservative side in certain debates. And I think you're talking particularly about cultural debates in yeah. the United States, about, about the authority of the canon. Right. Um, and one of the problems which, one of the ways in which this has been formulated yes. is in terms of the idea of political correctness, PC, very much, I think, an American totally phenomenon. Totally, totally. Um, in which, well, I guess the question about PC is, is it, from your point of view, just another red scare, the idea that there are people on the campuses who are trying to gag anybody whose views they don't agree with. Yes and no. That, of course, 
the, the idea that there is a small left cabal in the American university sort of running things and declaring what can be read and what can't be read, that's total tommy rot. It's just total bullshit. Uh, but on the other hand, there is an important and interesting debate, and that is what do we people, let's say subalterns or the oppressed or the formerly suppressed, whatever, whatever designation you are, people of color, right? What do we do uh, as we confront the canon? The alternatives are generally formulated, in my opinion, in rather impoverishing ways. One way is to say, we're not, if we're people of color, we're not going to read anything by whites. If we're women, we're not going to read anything by men. If we're gays, we're not going to read anything by straight, and so on and so forth. That is to say, to replace one canon with another. And, and in that respect, I, I have no sympathy for that, because it simply condemns us, you, to a new marginality, because there's nothing easier for uh, for uh, sort of uh, political correctness bashers who have turned themselves into an industry in America today. The people who write these books, you know, like the tenured radicals and the, you know, Dinesh D'Souza's book on uh, illiberal education, all, all, I mean, it's just complete uh, Tommy Rock going around saying this is what these people want. Uh, all right, let's give them departments of African American studies, let's give them gay studies, let's give them all that, but let us get on with it. The other alternative is not to substitute one canon for another not to become Afrocentric where you first were Eurocentric or you know, genocentric if you were first, uh, if you were uh, phallocentric, but rather to say, let us try and understand the construction of the canons. I mean, what do these, what do these objects serve, number one? And number two, most important from my point of view, how are they related to each other? In other words, it seems to me that the history of imperialism and the history of colonization, the history of oppression, as experienced by blacks, as experienced by Palestinians, as experienced by uh, gays, by women. All of that is built upon segregation, is built upon separation. So the worst thing, ethically and politically, is to let separatism simply go on without understanding the opposite of separatism, which is connectedness. And so in that respect, I'm very conservative, namely, I want to see how everything works. I'm not just interested in, you know, my I'm not interested just in Palestinian themes in, uh, in, in American literature or Palestinian themes in French literature. What I'm interested in is how all of these things work together because that seems to me to be the great task and to connect them all to each other to understand wholes rather than bits of whole.